Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, uh, looking at one of the biggest uh, positions in the portfolio, uh, the offshore service sector. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the portfolio publicly available on eToro. Uh, let's get into it, give my thoughts and why it makes up such a massive uh, percentage of the portfolio waiting. Disclaimer, nothing I say here is financial advice. Uh, I'm not qualified to give financial advice. I don't give advice. This is just me uh, giving my opinions and sharing them with the world. So it's just me, my opinion, what I'm doing might be right, might be wrong. I make zero guarantees uh, and certainly make zero uh, solicitations or advice, I guess, uh, in terms of financial advice. So there we go. Disclaimer out of the way. Do your own due diligence, guys. Uh, one, I guess, solicitation is for my publication uh, that I do run, the Options Mavericks. This is how I uh, generate income by selling insurance or, or options over publicly traded stocks. Uh, this year so far, I'm having a, a very nice year, 36% uh, up uh, in the portfolio year to date, obviously that's um, it cannot guarantee performance passes, no guarantee of future performance and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, seeing exactly what I uh, am doing and uh, running that portfolio, you can check it out uh, free for seven days, of course, with the Substack free trial. It's not theory. It's just me sharing videos, uh, breaking everything down uh, and what I what I do, documenting my journey and having some fun. So details in the link below. So far, people have been really uh, happy with the publication. So there you go. There's my, my pitch uh, today, uh, letting you know about it. This graphic, anyone want to guess what it is? Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of spending for renewable energy. And what I want to point out is this green part here. What is that green part here? That is the percentage contributed by emerging markets. Okay. So as you can see, when things, the point of this is when things get tough, emerging markets can't afford to spend money on silly stuff like uh, low energy return on energy investment projects. Okay. And so that's something that's going to be important. Why? Because in those areas of the world, you have population growth and you have the population that is growing, okay, also growing their energy ex uh, expenditure. And so they're hitting the, the stage of the S-curve that I've spoken about uh, and in various other uh, interviews, you'll be able to hear me go in with uh, expert guests uh, diving into that topic. So the point is, uh, this is, a, I guess, a really, a really important factor as to where money goes when things get tough. You find out where it should go. It's going to its... Um, highest and best use, let's say, uh, most effective, most efficient means of energy generation, okay? And that's the topic, really, that's the whole story of this offshore uh, oil services and oil drill thesis. These are some quotes that I've taken from a, a wonderful article, and uh, I've literally just taken them out verbatim and put them in here. And I hopefully uh, will be able to give you guys a sense as to where I think all, where I think a lot of capital is going. And I want to be at the receiving end of that capital by uh, the owner, by owning the beneficiaries of um of that capital. And I think that the offshore uh, industry is really ripe now. I, I waded my toe into the water in 2021 and 2022, uh, but I thought the producers would be a better play as a recover, like a recovery play on oil. And now I think we're getting this, uh, this ripple effect. The first ripples have happened, the second ripples are happening, and I think we're getting further out um, into the offshore space. The drilled but uncompleted wells, the ducks, they're basically run out. So you had a whole lot of uh, shut-ins during COVID. We are basically through uh, all of those now. Uh, CapEx has been poor for the last number of years in this uh, sector. And so it's really time, uh, if, if we're going to avoid a, a real supply squeeze, uh, a lot of CapEx needs to be developed uh, and needs to be contributed uh, contributing to future production and offshore i believe is where a lot of that is going to uh, going to end up so the offshore industry can look forward to 100 billion a year in capex commitments through to 2024 twice the expected investment in offshore renewables and offshore activity will outpace onshore oil projects by about 50% according to Reistart Energy, okay? So why is that? Well, in the past, it was very expensive, uh, relatively speaking, to drill offshore. Why would you drill offshore at a, I don't know, 80, $90 per barrel break even when you can get the oil out of the ground onshore for a much lower break even? 
doesn't take a genius to to figure that out. Offshore really only occurred in those super uh, super cycles where the the price of oil permitted uh, a viable business opportunity. Next point, in South America, Brazil is preparing a program of blowout investments that will nearly double production and vault the country into fourth place amongst oil producers in 20, uh, by 2030. Another reason I'm very bullish about South America in general, and particularly Brazil, because they have the opportunity to do this. You guys know, you know my thoughts on Petrobras. Big reactivation, uh, rig, rig reactivation will continue through 2023, while the fleet of available units will continue to diminish and to support drilling programs that are forecast through to 2030. It's highly likely new construction in the drilling segment will need to begin again within the next two months. That's saying there's not enough offshore service vehicles or rigs. That's what they're saying, uh, essentially. And so within the next two years, we're going to find the market's going to find out and there'll be a, a construction cycle that will have a lag. And then no doubt there'll be an oversupply and everything will fall to shit again. Um, but we've got a we've got a few years worth of of runway for this play from what i gather in the near term more new oil will have to come from somewhere the iea expects global demand will increase by about 8 million barrels per day by the decade's end and if it's the iea saying that you will you can almost bet your bottom dollar they will revise that demand figure upwards at the end of the decade they're always sandbagging on uh, demand estimates anyway Outputs from existing fields will drop by 18 million barrels a day. So if you take the, the net of that, that's 26 million barrels a day of unmet demand that will need to be filled by 2030. So where are you going to find 26 million barrels a day? That's a lot, guys. That's a lot. Can we just turn the shale tap on, you might be thinking? Uh, and the answer most people think is no. And this, I guess, is something that or one of many graphs that, that support that idea if you look to 2014, when the shale uh, tap was turned on, they ramped up production. Shale essentially allows you to front end load your production. So you, you might have the same amount of reserves, but the, the, the engineering is such that you can get more of your, more of your oil reserves out quickly. But of course, the, the other side of that coin is that you deplete your reserves far more quickly also. So if we look at how many barrels these guys are producing per 1,000 feet, uh, lateral length, you can see that the, we've hit a ceiling here. And if they could produce more, they would. So we have seen the growth rate slow and we've seen a slight decline from uh, this la these last two bars here on the graph. So if shale growth continues to decline, then what a lot of people are thinking, i.e., oh, we can just turn on the shale uh, tap and we can increase production to fill that 26 million expected gap, uh, will be proven to be incorrect. And we may get, or those people may get a nasty surprise on the upside for oil. So why are you going to go out uh, offshore? And here I think is a really important graph and says it all on the right-hand side. As a result, the break-evens for a number of major offshore projects have declined from $91 per barrel to $46 per barrel. So they've you know, basically halved. That is significant because that is a game changer now shale is not what it used to be so it's kind of taken out of the game the old excuse for not exploring offshore was it was too expensive well if you halve your costs obviously you start to become more of uh, more interesting from a, a capex perspective in terms of a vo another viable option to uh to find oil all righty uh this is a, an overview of the supply curve since uh, we've had, I would assume, a lot of restructurings in the offshore space. So what I want to point out here, just a couple of things. If you look at the deep water, which is, uh, as far as I understand, the most expensive of the offshore plays, this has come down a lot. And it's break even on the uh, dependent variable here on the y-axis is on pass, according to this at least, with the, the Middle East uh, plays. So, you know, $32 a barrel, $36 a barrel. Um, you, you're, starting to, you're starting to get into a very, very viable break even uh, if this is true and correct for offshore or offshore oil production. Okay, so that's all well and good. 
how am I playing it in terms of eToro? Completely differently to how I'm playing it in my personal account because I just don't have the same access to individual stocks on eToro than I do on my other brokerage platforms. But anyway, the point here, the Vanek uh, ETF, OIH, um, is the one I am using it on eToro. It's, a, I believe, a capped weighted index. It's got all the major offshore oil services uh, from Schlumberger and Baker Hugh Technologies, uh, more on the technological side, Transocean, uh, you know, drill rigs and that sort of thing. They're a, a broad spectrum. So we're buying the sector, expecting the whole sector will do well. Obviously, within the sector, there'll be outperformers and underperformers, but we think that this sector is likely to outperform, or I think this sector is likely to outperform the market. Just drawing your attention down here, XES is a an ETF I prefer. It's more of a, an evenly keeled or equally weighted index. Um, and so I've been writing a lot of options on uh, this particular ETF um, for capital gains or income. So if you're a member of the options, options Maverick, you know all about that. Okay, so... Here, if we look at the percentage changes over the last 20 odd years, you can see everything is basically in lockstep with oil. So we had the super spike and then both these ETFs um, peaked and then they troughed. And you can see, um, if you look at the charts, if you look back to 2014, when oil peaked at around $140 a barrel, let's call it, and there were, these, stop, these ETFs were trading at double their, their current pricing, okay? So there, there's still... Um, you know, if you if you think oil is going to continue to do well, these companies have smaller enterprise value now because they've paid off a lot of their debt, and so there may be a lot of room to to return to the upside. And any time that that opportunity is in play with an ETF, to me, um, it's certainly worth consideration. So that's just my thoughts. Comparing the two holdings here in terms of, as you can see, more evenly weighted here in XES, whereas you had almost a 20% uh, valuation weighting or, uh, towards Schlumberger in the OIH. That's just, I guess, the, the main reason between the two to point out. So that's that. Uh, I'm long the ETF um, and expecting wonderful things for this industry. We'll see what happens. I believe there's a marginal, uh, there is a margin of safety with most of these companies trading it below their tangible book value. They're expected, um, the expected capex to flow into this sector could be quite explosive and we could see a significant re-rate to the upside. They don't have the debt that they used to, so it's quite possible that institutions will look at these and, and be willing to pay higher multiples. So not only are their day rates and therefore their earnings and profits going to be higher, but the profit multiples uh, over which the market is willing to pay these for the to own these businesses could certainly expand as well uh, for that very reason. So I have about uh, 10% at the moment of assets under management plus long certain individual stocks uh, like Transocean that I've spoken about for a long time. It's been the number one performing uh, stock in the portfolio and I continue to write options for a nice little income uh, the more I don't know if a few guys around the world have noticed it um, I'm currently in Australia and I'll be doing some traveling later in the year but I've just noticed the weakness in the Aussie dollar recently compared to um, compared to the greenback so the uh, yeah the, um, <clears throat> the the quantitative tightening uh, or the, the the differential between central banks and the the forex is really starting to um, uh, to come to the fore. So, yeah, that's why I save in multiple currencies, guys. You never know when uh, when that can really help you out. Anyway, that's it for today. Any questions and comments, please do leave them in the comment section. Please like and subscribe. And if you want to hit me up on Twitter at the ROI channel, for those of you who like this investment style, you can invest directly on eToro. You just download the app. Uh, find my portfolio on there. Link is in the description and you just copy the portfolio and you're done. Or if you just want to add it to a watch list and uh, continue to stay updated with my thoughts, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Thank you guys. Take care. And I look forward to catching up with you in another video shortly.